We're in the middle of a series entitled Surrounded. I have probably received the most feedback of, of a series we've done ever. I think people are starting to realize the gravity of our relationship with Jesus, how significant repentance is, and pr- protecting ourselves from the enemy. So today we're going to, I'm going to jump right into it here. I have a, probably more scripture than I have ever done in a message. We got through it in the first service, so I know we can do it in this service. I was thinking, though, I, I think if the Chiefs make the Super Bowl, just hear me out, just hear this, before you start being all judgy eyes, I think you guys as family should probably send me. Now, hear me out. Just hear me. Hear me. When the Royals were in the playoffs in 14 and 15, I went to six games, and guess how many of those games we lost? Zero. Now, I have watched the Chiefs lose at home in playoff games. Let's not live in the past. I'm one for one this year. And if we win today, I think it's win. Oh, I'm not that fan. When we win, I, we could probably get me there for probably six or 7,000. No, no, hear me. I don't expect any one of you to do it. That's unrealistic. So you guys talk about this as a family when I'm done. I'll make sure my car, I'll drive too. I don't even, I'll drive to Miami. So today, you know, the second game is the 49ers. It's, is it the Bears? Oh, the Packers. I forgot. I forgot. I forgot. The... <laughs> you nobody wants it to be the Packers and the Chiefs more than State Farm, right? Discount double check. Aaron Rodgers, Patrick Mahomes in the same Super Bowl, but uh, no. but I do like football, but, so, but this is really more important today. I know we joke a lot, but there, there's a gravity about this series that has really been on my heart. Just I, There has been some interesting things even in our house, in my life. It's like, huh, we start this series, it's like the enemy just doesn't want to sit back and, and watch us walk in freedom. So even in our life, in my family, there's just been some things I'm like, God, we have to fight this battle. But today, let's look at the fall of Satan and what does that mean for us? So a lot of churches, I get it. We have some awesome churches and I'm with most pastors. I would rather preach about heaven and be the best version of you you could ever possibly be. It's honestly more, well, fun's not a word, but it's more pleasure than that, enjoyable. I could like to be kind of, you know, funny. I I guess I always say funny is, that's not, I don't get to decide what's funny, you do, but I like to have some fun at church and really kind of joke around. But when we get on these series, it's just, there's a heaviness about this that we need to talk about. If we're going to love the good things, then we need to understand that there's also evil that exists in this world. And it's real. And Satan is more than just a little cute guy on your shoulder and an angel. Uh, according to 1 Peter 5, he's out to, like a roaring lion, seeking who he can devour. John 10.10 10 says he's out to kill you and to steal and to destroy every area of your life. So if we're going to have an enemy, we need to know his plan, right? Just like the Chiefs today, there's one enemy. It's, it's Derrick Henry. That's it. I don't care about the rest of them. We've got to stop one player. We're going to do it. But in a real sense in our life, we have to understand that who is Satan? How, why, how did he fall? Why did he fall? And is he up to the same schemes today in our lives and in our culture? So let's do it. Let's jump into it. Lucifer, as he was known, as he was created, I love what Dr. Ron Rhodes says this, and I like this. I, I read this in a book recently, and I'm, like, I'm going to start my message with this. And it says this, Lucifer became so impressed with his own beauty, intelligence, power and position, that he began to desire for himself the honor and glory that belonged to God alone. This pride represents the actual beginning of sin in the universe, preceding the fall of human by an interdetermined time. We don't know when this happened, but we usually go to the first sin as Adam and Eve, but it's actually Satan in heaven. When Satan fell, according to Revelation chapter 12, one-third of the angelic host joined him in rebellion. The other created angels fell with him. These angels who fell with Satan are are now known as demons. Hell was prepared for Satan and his angels. 
demons and fallen angels, when you read in the Bible, if any time you read the idea of demons or fallen angels, that represents demons. Same thing, they're interchangeable in Scripture. So when you read fallen angels in the Bible, it says that in other places, Job talks about it, Ezekiel talks about it, different places in the Bible, Genesis chapter 6 talks about the sons of God and the daughters of man, that's talking about fallen demonic angels, okay? That's what the Bible means. We can try to make it say something because we're uncomfortable with it, but why don't we just let the Bible say what the Bible says and leave the dividing up to God, okay? Demons and false teachers are potent enemies of God's people, but they never need to, we never need to fear them. I need to hear that, say this to start. A lot of times when we start digging into things of the demonic realm and spiritual beings and spiritual possession and oppression, it's easy to become fearful in our lives, fearful for our kids, fearful for our marriage. Have I opened up my life to demons? Is ever in my life demons? Well, that's, the Bible says that God is not the author of confusion, nor is he about, he did not give us a spirit of fear. If you are walking in fear or confusion, that is not from God. So that's why this is not rocket science. Although I believe in we need a lot more teaching and classes and training. This is not like a, a, you just have to get a master's degree. Here's why. Here's why. If once we identify the enemy, then Jesus begins to fight the enemy for us. So this gets really confusing when we're like, we have to name every spirit and every demon and we need to call them out by name and we need to, sure. Do I want to know the most I can about the spiritual world? Yes. Should I study? Yes. Should I understand the schemes of the enemy? Yes. But it becomes confusing when we try to begin this journey of identifying every demon and every devil in hell. I'm going to call you out by name. I'm going to, when Jesus just said, depart from me. He wasn't like, wait, who are you? He tried, right? And that, that, he didn't, Jesus didn't have to do that. Jesus wasn't like, wait, what kind of, what am I dealing with here? Now, hear me again. There are certain spirits that invade our life and can invade the earth. The spiritual world is real. And I believe this, let me say this, what we open ourselves to is what spirit we welcome into our lives. I do believe that with all my heart. But I don't want this to turn into a confusing thing or a fearful thing. It's actually awesome to know that in the end, the Bible says that he won. And because he won, we win. So don't let this turn into a fearful thing like there's demons everywhere. They're out to get us. They're in my kids, in my spouse, everywhere. Is it a spiritual battle? According to Ephesians 6, everything we do is a spiritual battle. But once we identify the enemy... We don't have to walk around fearful. We walk around with something else that's called authority. And we don't walk in our own authority. We walk in the authority given to us by God. You see, notice this. Demons and false teachers serve the purpose of God. Why, this is, I'm going to say this in a way you've got to listen clearly. Serve the purpose of God and are restrained by the mighty hand of the Lord. The Lord is never responsible for evil, but does use the actions of the enemies of God to accomplish the will of God. So the, what does the Bible say? He takes what the enemy meant for evil, and he turns it for good. So even though God doesn't cause evil, he wasn't the author of evil, he can take anything and turn the situation around for his plan. There are times in my life where I feel like this is such a spiritual attack. And when I look back, it was God was there the whole time showing me, I've made you stronger than you think you are. I've created you for more than you think you were created for. I have been going to accomplish things. Notice this is still never about me. It's still about him. He, I, him. I'm going to accomplish things in you, God, through the spirit. So what I see is evil. I need to recognize as evil, but realize that God can use this situation to accomplish his will. It's easy to be tempted to be fearful and discouraged regarding evil. Remind yourself that God is sovereign. That means he's total control, it's total control over everything, including evil. Wherever you are and whatever you have going on, serve the Lord faithfully. And what does the Bible say? When you submit to the Lord, resist the devil and he will flee. Submission always precedes, right? Submission always precedes resistance. 
We just want to resist, but we don't want to submit. They go hand in hand. When you submit to the Lord, you are given the ability to resist. So today we're going to look at absolutely paragraphs of Scripture. Are we okay with that? Okay, we're going to go through a lot of Scripture today. The story at this time is Lucifer, Satan, fall, is described in two Old Testament chapters, Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. Both of these chapters are going to start off talking about earthly kingdoms, Tyre and Babylon. And he's speaking to a king, and then he's going to use the story of prophecy against the king and bring in the fall of Satan to show these kings how easy it is to get caught up in your own rebellion and fall. Does that make sense? So a lot of scripture, hear me, is narrative writing where Jesus is, or God is speaking as someone to someone. Then we get allegoric to where it's just talking about one thing, but it really is using that thing to tell us another thing, like Song of Solomon. It's an allegory. It's using the story of man and woman and the love relationship between a husband and wife to show the love and passion God has for us. So a lot of times in Scripture, we're going we're to see it talking about man, but the meaning many times is us. Okay, here we go. Ezekiel 28. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man. Take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre and say to him, this is what the sovereign Lord says. You are the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Talking about Lucifer here. He's going to say what he did. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you. And we could go through these. A lot of them aren't even still things today. Things like, things are real. Some of topaz and onyx and jasper are real. Some of them are things we don't even know what they are anymore. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. And on the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as guardian cherub, for so I adorned you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walk among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God, and I expelled you, guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart become proud on the account of your beauty and your corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. By your many sins and dishonest trade, you have desecrated your sanctuaries. So I made a fire come out from you and it consumed you and I reduce you to the ashes on the ground and in the sight of all who were watching. All the nations who knew you are appalled at you and you have become to a horrible end and will be no more. Now, this sounds like Satan was thrown out of heaven never to return, but this doesn't mean that Satan has no further access to heaven. For other scriptures clearly indicate that Satan maintained this access after his fall. However, Ezekiel 28, 18 indicates that Satan was absolutely and completely cast out of God's heavenly government and his place of authority. Luke 10, 18 will also say this. And then when we get to Isaiah, how you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been morning star is what Lucifer means, morning star. Son of the dawn, you have been cast down to earth and you once who laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon, and I will ascend above the top of the clouds and I will make myself like the most high. But you who are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. Both of these are using a typology to talk about Satan. Again, stick with me here. I don't fall asleep on me. We, we, we need to hear the word. Are we good today? Amen. I don't ask for amens a lot, but uh, I, there you go. Who said amen? That was a good one. That was a good timing. Good timing on that one. If you say it with a hey in the front, like, hey, man, it even gets me going even. There you go. Wow, that was good. When we read these passages, there's a dual reference. God, we talked about that. As a result of this sin against God, Lucifer was banished from the living in heaven, Isaiah 14, 12. He became corrupt, and his name was changed. This is really important. His name was changed 
from Lucifer, morning star, to Satan, adversary. Isn't it amazing what sin will do in our lives? When we live a life of blatant sin against God, it literally changes our character. It changes our very, our very core of who we are when we walk in unrepentant, just total sin. Now, 1 John clearly states that if we, in, in chapter 1, that if we say we're without sin, we make God out to be a liar. All of us in this room have sinned. All of us will still struggle with sin, but Satan had a lifestyle, or Lucifer at the time walked in a total rebellion against God. When we walk in a rebellious state, we can never be who God called us to be. Lucifer, morning star, the Bible talks about worship was in him, goes from the most beautiful of all the created angels to now his name is Satan, which means adversary. You have a choice. And this sounds really strong today, but I need to say it this strong. You either stand as an instrument God can use, or you are an adversary to his plan in the earth, but you can't have it both ways. That's strong, I get it. That's real strong. But you see, his power became completely perverted. And his destiny followed the second coming of Christ is to be bound in a pit during the thousand-year millennial reign, right, Uh, of the kingdom over which Christ will rule. Revelation 20, um, verse 3 talks about that. And eventually he'll be thrown into the lake of fire. Matthew 25, 41, Jesus is giving in Matthew 25 what we know as the um, all that discourse, and he's on the Mount of Olives, and they ask him, how will we know when the end is coming? Eventually, he gives them. Here's what's going to happen to Satan. He will be thrown into the lake of fire. Revelation 20 says this, And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the keys to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon. Ooh, come on. That's what Jesus is going to do to Satan. Aren't you thankful? I don't have to do this. And that ancient serpent who is the devil or Satan and bound him for a thousand years, he threw him into the abyss and locked it and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. We don't have a l- time to teach on the end of the millennial reign. Satan will be released to deceive the ones, I believe, who were born during the thousand-year reign. Everyone must choose Jesus. If we are in the millennial, the thousand-year reign, after the tribulation of Christ, our souls are, we are good. We've already been judged. We're going to heaven but there will be people, I believe there will be, as in the day, there will be people that will be born during this time, and they will have to choose. Satan will be released, and they'll have to choose Jesus or a light eternity away from him. Are we good on that? That's, that I probably shouldn't have went there, but the, email me if you want to know more about that. Uh, Mike at New Life Oak Grove. <laughs> no, you can email me. In Genesis chapter 3, we're, we're, we're building here, all right? So Satan was thrown from the earth. Okay, now what, what happened then? Well, now we get to Genesis chapter 3. And this is where our role in this whole saga begins. Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, sorry about that, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. Let me tell you this. I believe God's law, and you can say, wait, we're we're under grace. Absolutely, but Jesus didn't came to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. So God's law or his plan for our life, I would say it a lot, is a fence not to keep us out from good things. It's to keep bad things from getting in. We need to study the laws of God, especially the New Testament law, the greatest of all the commandments. We're going to go there, but we need to know God's plan for our life. The reason is God makes it clear. God's plan for your life is not this hidden agenda that he's like, maybe, just maybe. If you're good enough, you're smart enough, you'll just be so holy, I will reveal myself to you. God reveals himself through the written word. He's revealed this plan for your life. Now, the details sometimes can be hard, like, jobs and marriages, but his plan for your life is to be holy as he is holy and to do what he did, seek and save the lost. This isn't rocket science, but it's really hard because I have to go against my nature to walk in his nature. 
Okay, we're going to teach on that a little bit more in the next. We have about 15 to 20 minutes left. Is that okay? Okay. Um, now the serpent was recreating to eat from the tree of the garden. The woman said to the serpent, we may not eat, but God did, right? But God did say, he's, she's saying, here's what he said. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat it, from your, eye, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. We're starting to see the Satan's scheme has not changed even today. The, the, the plan of him is to always ask you to rebel against God, and it's almost always an issue of pride. It's almost, we're going to, oh, stick with me here. When he told her, listen, he just doesn't want you to know what he knows. He doesn't want you, no, don't start pulling back the curtains of what's real. Don't start looking at spiritual warfares in your family. Don't start guarding what you allow in your home. Who cares what your kids watch? Who cares what you talk about? Who cares what you do? It's God, it, that's just religion. That's the, no, that's not real. No, his tactics have not changed. How do I know that? Because in Revelation chapter 12, this isn't in my notes, but it talks about Satan as the accuser who accuses them before God day and night. His idea is no different to begin to remind you it's all good. And then when you do mess up, when your eyes are open to sin, he wants to remind you of how much of a bad person you don't stack up. You're not good enough. God can't use you. Now watch the result of this. So when the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Notice they have never noticed their nakedness until sin. What were they struggling with? Shame. Shame is what the accusations of Satan try to have you feel. In the South, they were naked, right? For the first time, they were just naked. They didn't realize it. And all of a sudden, they're like, we, we don't have any clothes on. That is an extreme example. But how many of you in this room, when you struggle, struggle with sin, begin to really doubt who you are and your character and who you are as a husband and who you be, as a wife, as a mom, you begin to doubt all those things in your life? Most of the time, if we'll be honest with ourselves and we'll trace these things back, a lot of times it's to just sin in our life that we're trying to hold on to. And we're going to talk about mainly what this sin looks like in our life. But he is the accuser. He accuses you day and night to God. He accuses you through demonic things in your life. And if we don't stop and bind Satan, the Bible says, Jesus will bind Satan. If we don't speak life, we are opening ourselves up to attacks of the enemy to continue to convince us that we're just not enough. And then the man, then the man and the wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. From the Lord God among the trees of the garden, but the Lord called to man, where are you? Someone in the first service came up to me, one of my favorite people in all the world. He's such a godly man. He said, you know, the first question asked in the Old Testament is, God asks man, where are you? But he said, look to the first question asked in the New Testament. It's the wise man saying, God, where are you? you. That is powerful. In the beginning, God was looking for man like, what have you done? Then when Jesus came, now it's man looking for God. God, where are you? We need you. And I find that interesting that Adam and Eve had never hidden before. They've never noticed they were naked before. But when we are surrounded like this series by a spiritual battle, and when the enemy was released into the earth when they ate, it's amazing. The first thing he brought was shame. Shame. But what got him in this predicament? Pride. Pride is the root of almost all sin. When you begin to study scripture, it's pride. And we go through what happened. They were cursed. We had to work harder. Childbearing would be excruciating. I don't know nothing about that. And again, they were cursed. What happened was, and then Satan cursed, the, or God cursed the serpent, and all these things began to happen. But it 
some unknown time in the past, when Satan rebelled against God, he rebelled against the Lord, and this beautiful creature became our adversary. But we need to understand this adversary and what that means to us. What happened to Satan? The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. And the ruler of the kingdom of the air and the spirit who is at work at those who are disobedient. Satan, after the fall, then was released into the spiritual realm of earth. With him was one-third of the angels, which became demons, which means while we are here on earth, we are being spiritually attacked all the time. All the time. And the enemy is crafty, the Bible says. The enemy is good about deceiving us in the areas of our strengths and our weaknesses. And we have to be alert, sober-minded, the Bible says. In Ephesians, Paul tells us to redeem the days or knowing the times. We are to live as wise and not unwise, making the most of every opportunity. Ephesians 6 tells us to stand, to be on our guard for our adversary. 1 Peter 5, I said, right, is a roaring lion. This is a real stuff here. We have to be on the alert because when Satan and his demons are, are, are active in the earth, their goal is to pull us away from the things of God. St. Augustine wrote this talking about the, the deadly sins. Pride is the commencement of all sin. What is the sin of pride? This is what we're going to end with. The sin of pride is a preoccupation with self. The sin of pride is a preoccupation with self. Proverbs 8 says this, to fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech. When we hear pride, a lot of you are like, oh good, I am the opposite of prideful. Like take pride, I'm the opposite. I have such little pride, such low self-esteem that I am good because I don't walk in pride. Pride means you think you're the best, but that's actually not what, not what pride, pride means. When I look to God's word, I found a, a view of us that is actually complex. We are com a complex people, human beings. But surprisingly, when I study scripture, there is no biblical category for a person who does not love himself or herself enough. Nowhere in the Bible does it say those of you that have low self-esteem or think so lowly of yourself. Why? Instead, humanity is portrayed as naturally selfish. We are never told to love ourselves more because this is not a problem known to humanity. This is not an issue. Love yourself more. Now, some of you are like, what? I, what do you mean by that? When Jesus was asked to define the greatest commandment, he told the Pharisees that the greatest command had two parts, including the directive to love your neighbor as yourself. Apparently, Jesus already assumed from that day and forward that you really do love yourself. I don't think this means that we are. Now, here's where, here's where it's important. Watch this. I don't think that this means that we, that we all love ourselves correctly as God does, but I do think that Jesus was alluding to our natural tendency to put our needs and desires ahead of those and of others. You see, when we don't keep this selfishness in check, it manifests itself in two ugly ways, arrogance and insecurity. Now we're like, right, right? You're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. We all get the arrogance part, but what about the insecurity? We live in a very insecure culture. Our culture says this, and I, I say this a lot lately, but I want you to hear this. Our culture says, do you. Be the best you. Take care of you. Love your body. Is that bad? Of course not. But all the emphasis is on loving yourself when biblical emphasis, in, emphasis is on walking in the love that he created in you and for you. Two, these are totally separate issues in our life. 
So again, I've said this a lot recently, but I want to say it again. Self-esteem is not from God. We live in a self-esteem culture, which means to esteem you, which means to give yourself value. But our only esteem, according to the word, is found in him. Here's why that matters. Hear me. I'm all about, like the Bible says, I am a conqueror, that I have a spiritual authority. The Bible says that I carry power. The Bible says that I can speak to demons and talk with authority. So don't you dare downplay the authority you have in yourself, but the authority is not about you, it's about him. When I walk in his authority and his ability and his love in my life, it's not about what I see in the mirror. It's about whose creation I see in the mirror. So my value was found in Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's different. To have low self-esteem still means you're putting value that was never meant for you to put anyway. And that's why I think we have so many Christians. One of the reasons we struggle with depression so much is because we're battling two kingdoms. Americans take four times more antidepressant medicine than the rest of the world combined. Combined. Because we've bought into a lie, even in the church, that I have to just begin to just have this, the most perfect body image and take care of me. And then when I have really low self-esteem, it's still about me. Woe is me. Nobody loves me enough. Nobody cares about me enough. If that hadn't happened in my past, am I downplaying that? No, that is real stuff. But when I begin to find my nature, you guys can play. You're already up here. Let's go. Right? It may surprise you to think of insecurity as a distortion of self-love, but like arrogance, It is self-focused and self-obsessing in nature. The reason I want to focus on this idea is because Satan fell because of pride. Satan then tempted Eve with maybe he just doesn't want you to know what's best for you. Pride. I think a lot of us, the reason we even want to be set free is a prideful thing. Like, I just want to become this most perfect Christian. Some of us need to take a deep breath and just rest in his love. Some of us are searching for answers that has already been given to us in the word. And we're making this this complex math problem with God. It's like, it's just simple math. Me plus nothing equals everything. Right? You get that? It's simple math. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. When I empty myself out, as the Bible says, when I become a slave to the cross, Paul says, I, among all the apostles, I'm the least apostle. Do you know what I've done in my past? I'm the least apostle. He was stating, don't look at me as a super Christian. I'm just one person in a great kingdom trying to do my part being led by the Spirit. But there's another side to this I need to talk about today. Why is pride such an issue? Parents, hear me today. We are raising egomaniacs in the American culture. I've been around the world. Lydia, are you you here today? Lydia went to the Philippines and got engaged. But in cultures and other cultures around the world, The kids aren't made to be gods. They are just one part of a family unit. Everyone is expected to have their role. But in the American culture, we don't ever want our kids to be sad, disappointed, hurt, let down. So we build our entire life around them. All of our time, money, effort, energy is to value our little baby, our little babies. And the problem is we're raising them to feel like the sun and the moon revolve around them. And we have to be careful. Do I do a lot for my kids? Absolutely. Do I want them to be happy? Not, I don't, my kids will tell you, I don't, I don't worry about that that much. I'm more worried about their joy, which is a relationship with Jesus. But it's okay. We've, we're raising kids that think the world revolves around them and when they go to church and they hear it's about a relationship with Jesus it's not about them it's confusing we need to be careful our kids are being attacked by the enemy like I don't want to say never before because that's a presumptuous thing I don't know before this is the only time I know but I do know that our young people are being attacked at an alarming rate 
And parents, we, it's our job. It's our responsibility to raise them in the fear and the love of Jesus. See, spiritual battles start at a young age. And we're going to talk about this a lot uh, in two weeks, two, two, one to two weeks. Parents, be careful what you allow in your home. My wife had to help me this week. I had to be helped. Because sometimes when I get home, I just let the kids have the remote and watch whatever they want. And my wife, don't, homie, don't play those games. <laughs> but I'm sometimes oblivious, and I'll just walk in, and they just get to watch whatever they want. And there's just been things in our home that I've allowed that is not okay for my household. And I'm going to stand before God, and as the head of my home, I'm going to answer for what I allowed in my home. It was a great reminder. I don't like to hear it. I'm like, every person. I'm like, no, I don't do it. Maybe I do that. Do I do that? I think maybe I do that. I didn't think I did. Do I do that? Yeah, I do that. But the Bible talks over and over. Here's the answer, and I'm done with this. You see, even though God permitted the entrance of Satan into the garden, for a purpose. This does not mean that God wished Adam and Eve to sin. He didn't force them to sin. Though they were tempted by a crafty and intelligent being, they did not have to sin. We do not have to be bound by sin. The Bible says where grace abounds should sin abound. Paul says by no means. We do not have to be bound by sin. Scripture teaches that with every temptation, God always provides a means to escape. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, chapter 10, in verse 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. How did Jesus fight the temptations of Satan? What did he do? He quoted the word we got to begin to hide this thing in our heart, people. Church, if you don't commit to time in the Word, you are setting yourself up for disaster. You are setting yourself up to be attacked by the enemy, and this is a battle you cannot win. You do not have the ability to win this battle. And if you're like, man, you are really intense today. Like, is it that big of a deal? I'm not even scratching the surface on how big of a deal this battle is. So today, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray. The worship team is going to pray, play. They're going to, they're going to play. I'm going to.